Um, good afternoon. Thanks. Thank you for coming to my talk. Uh, my name is Alexander, and I'm going to talk to you about old software from the 1990s. Um, so I'm a researcher at the University of Luxembourg, and so I work, basically I, I write software to analyze other software. <laughs> And we try to verify security properties. And an example would be to check if Android applications respect the principle of least privilege, for instance. Um, and so if you are in academia and you want to make sure you know something about a specific topic, well, the best way to go for it is to create a new course on this specific topic. So that's why I wanted to do. So I wanted to make sure I know a bit something about uh, software security. So I created a new course at the University of Luxembourg. Um, so I didn't start from scratch. So I have a background on reversing uh, vulnerabilities, specifically Java vulnerabilities. So those are existing vulnerabilities for which uh, there was no proof of concept. So I had to look at uh, patches, uh, find exactly where the vulnerability lies, and then uh, write a proof of concept for them. So I do have uh, publications uh, at academic uh, venues, such as CCS, and I also have uh, publications in uh, security magazines, uh, for instance, for the French speakers, uh, you will recognize this uh, MISC mag. Um, but there was something missing, right? So if you look at the life cycle of a vulnerability, so you have the birth of the vulnerability when some programmer introduces a vulnerability in the code, then someone has to discover the vulnerability, then um, the researcher can exploit the vulnerability, it can disclose the vulnerability, and then the developer of the target software will patch the vulnerability, and when all uh, the vulnerable versions have been patched, and uh, then the vulnerability is basically dead, right? So, and by, by doing this reverse uh, work on existing vulnerabilities, I was missing this uh, discovery part, uh, a disclosure part, and the patching part. So since I had a bit of experience uh, on Java security, I said, oh, let's just first the Java build a machine. And, of course, it failed. So we were, uh, so we did compile the Java build to a machine to try to fuzz it with AFL. And we were a bit naive because this piece of software is really huge. And if you want to do something interesting, if you want to find vulnerabilities, uh, then you have to pass uh, this uh, front end, which basically uh, checks that the class file is correct. Um, so, we said, oh, okay, so let's try try to first something simpler. What about an old DOS program? But first, what is DOS? So uh, two days ago, uh, you had uh, the chance to attend a talk about uh, Canon uh, cameras. So DOS in our context today is not the dry operating system developed by Canon. It does not mean denial of service, and it's not a dead operating system. So in the early days, so computers were running with punch cards until the late 60s, and after that, so people were starting to use uh, hard disks and floppy disks. And to actually um, access these devices, uh, they required um, some software, and that's how those disk operating systems were born. And so here, there are a bunch of examples, uh, because you had such an operating system for a different kind of hardware. So for Atari, you had the Atari DOS, and for PC compatibles, you had uh, MS-DOS, developed in the 1980s, and uh, more recently, you have the FreeDOS, which is an open source version of, uh, this, of the disk operating system for PC uh, compatibles. Um, 
And so basically, so in the 80s, that's, that's what a computer looked like. So it was a big box uh, with a small screen, and on the screen you had some something that looks like a terminal. And you notice here, um, so the floppy drive, so you can put some nice floppy with a um, very big amount of, uh, of uh, disk space, like one megabyte, ooh, that's huge. And, but is all those systems, so is DOS software st still used today? So I googled a bit, because I didn't know, and so I found out this article that has been published on this website I didn't know existed, so Jalopnik. And so there's a guy who interviewed an engineer from McLaren Automotive, and then the engineer says, so this was three years ago, right? So he says, oh, we are still using this DOS-based software system to, uh, to take care of those cars, and each car, yeah, it costs its value at $10 million uh, or more. And so the interview continues, and the guy says, oh, yeah, but it's a bit problematic because we rely on this specific model of laptop that is this compact LTE 5280 model of laptop. And, well, we have some some issues because it's not re reliable and it's really hard to find. I mean, we have to go on eBay to buy such models, and it's really hard. So hopefully now they have another kind of system because I really I, I wanted to, 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 to see if they really developed something more. Uh, not based on DOS, but I didn't find the answers, so I don't know. Hopefully they have something something that is not DOS-based by now. And so I googled a bit more, and then I found this uh, other article on this aled.com.au, and basically this article says, well, patient safety will be at risk if it is forced to stop using a crucial software system based on the MS-DOS platform. So this was also three years ago. So three years ago, you had hospitals in Australia that still relied on MS-DOS programs, right? Again, I don't know what this has become. Maybe they are still running this DOS program. Maybe they have a new program. Um, and today, a lot of people still want to play DOS games. Yes, because this was the good old times are very good old classic games. And what they do is that they basically run those, so they want to run those games on modern machines. And to be able to do that, so they use um, software uh, emulator, so this DOS emulator called DOSBox. And so I remember a long time ago, um, so I played this very old, old DOS engine called the Build Engine. And with this engine, it was really cool at the time because you could create new worlds or new uh, new map maps. So here on the left, you can see um, the 2D um, interface where you can actually create uh, walls or new rooms. And then here you just add textures on walls and then you have a fantastic world you can evolve in. Um, but this is a DOS game, right? So how can I fuzz this? So I need somehow to have um, a port to Linux or something. So I went to GitHub. I typed in, um, what did I type in? Build engine port. Hooray, 17 results. So I take the first one. It's a port of the build engine written in C, so that's kind of cool. Um, and then I have to fuzz it. So for those who do not know how fuzzing works, so basically... Here we have the target binary, which is the build engine, and we want to feed this engine with some input, and the input, in our case, are those map files. So you have a set of map files, and then you feed one, you take one map, you feed it to the program, you see if the program crashes. If it crashes, you save the input, because then you want to do the analysis. And after that, you, ch you change the input, you mutate it, you modify it to create new input file. And then you take randomly one input and you try to crash the program again. And so we did that on this port of the build engine. And so one problem you face when you try to fuzz such a program with a, uh, which is a 3D uh, engine is that you have to handle this 
um, graphic display parts. And we actually didn't want to fuzz this because it takes actually a lot of time to initialize the engine, to display all the information on the screen. So what we had to do is to remove all the code that has to do with the 3D engine, and we only kept so the last line and everything that we need to execute this last line, which is basically the parser for the map file. So we run that on AFL. So guess how much time it took us to discover vulnerabilities? Yeah, it was very quick. So it's maybe, so this is what AFL looks like. Maybe you cannot see it. So it took us like 28 seconds to find six different uh, crashes of vulnerabilities. Um, so then you analyze the input, you look at the source code, and we um, realized that, well, so in the code there is this global variable called sector that has a maximum number of sectors, which is uh, 1,024. And here in the parser, basically, you read from the input file the number of sector you have to read. So attacker controlled size, perfect. And then you copy basically the number of sector from this file to this buffer. And well, if the number of sector to copy is greater than this one, then boom, right? Basically you have a buffer overflow. So now can you actually exploit this vulnerability? So because it actually depends on the target system, so remember, that we did the fuzzing and the code analysis on a Linux port of the build engine. And modern operating systems do have mitigation techniques such as DEP or ASLR. So, it, and there's nothing really interesting to overwrite on the heap of this program or in the global variable section. So this vulnerability probably cannot be exploited on a modern system. What about the original DOS code? So the original DOS code also contains the vulnerability, but there is no security mechanisms on this kind of operating systems. Plus you have the code section, the heap section, and the stack that follow each other. And this vulnerability can thus probably be executed on a DOS operating system. So if you look uh, at a very abstract level of what the memory looks like for a DOS uh, program, so you first have the code section, then you have the global variable section, then you have the heap section, and then you have the stack section. And they all follow each other. So our buffer is here, and if we overflow the buffer, then we have to override part of the global variable section. We have to override the whole heap section, and then we have to override part of the stack. And let, what do you find on the stack? Well, you find the returned address of the current function. Um, all right, time for the first demo, if it works. Um, so where is it here? So let me clean this. Here I start DOSBox. Um, and what we first is this uh, engine. So it's basically a 3D engine. So here I play the game. Okay, open door, door, okay. So yeah, so this is sta state of the art 3D engine from the 1990s. And so I can select um, some specific map I want to play on. So here an ev evil map. So then I load this map here. All right, there's no one in this game, what is going on? So I continue here and here, so you have some zombies or whatever they are and I can shoot on the zombies and I can take some bazooka, whatever, and continue this, right? Oh no. Okay, so you get the point. Um, and now, so I want to exploit the vulnerability to execute arbitrary code. So I say, oh, I want to become master of EIP. So the instruction pointer. So I say, okay, I want this map to be loaded. All right. Oh, map not found. Okay, so that's 
I mean, you have to be polite, right? So I want to become master of EIP, please. All right. And now you have the calculator, right? Fantastic. All right, so, and then, so, so, so this vulnerability is for a 3D game engine, right? And then you're thinking, we had a, a talk, I think, yesterday about uh, games. And so when someone develops an engine, you have a lot of developers that want to write games for the, uh, based on the engine, right? So I, I looked on, on Wikipedia and I found out that, ah, okay. So there have been a lot of games uh, developed based on this on this engine. For instance, one of the most famous is Duke Nukem 3D. You have also Blood and Shadow Warrior. And w what was really surprising is that, so w here you have other games based on the Duke Nukem 3D code, so Redneck Rampage, other games. And you notice the last one, Ion Fury. So it's actually a game that is based on this engine that has been released this year, right? So you still have people developing games based on this build engine. All right, so now I'm a bit curious. I look on the internet about those games. Um, oh yeah, no, F first, first, yes. So um, so I have to, to disclose this vulnerability, right? Something I have never done before, so the first time. Uh, so I... So, so I did all the communication via email, right? But I will pretend I just phoned the guy. Hi. This is Alex, uh, so I just found a vulnerability in your game that you developed in the 90s. Um, yeah, very interesting, thank you. Uh, I already knew, I already knew about this. And by the way, you have this vulnerability also here, also there, and also there in the source code. Oh, wow, well, thank you very much. Um, and here's the contact to Voidpoint, so it's a company developing uh, this, uh, this game that has been released this year. So then I uh, contacted the company. They said, oh, well, thank you very much for your report. Uh, we have patched the game, right? So it only took them like two days to patch the game. Really cool. Um, and then so I, I tried to, to have a CVE number assigned to this vulnerability. So I went to Mitre. I said, hey, I want, I want this uh, a CVE number. They said, OK, we will give you this number. And then I was like, hmm, why is it written as reserved, right? I mean, I have a proof of concept. The developer have been informed. Um, this is still marked as reserved. So I tried to contact me. Hey, what's going on? Uh, why do I, don't I have the CVE? Never got any feedback from them, so I have no idea what's going on there. Um, and so I did a bit more research on the internet, and it turns out some of those games based on a build engine developed in the 1990s are still being sold today on the internet, right? So Shadow Warrior, Blood, or Redneck Rampage, you can go on the internet and buy those games. So Shadow Warrior, okay, so I looked at it. Ah, you can buy it for $7. Okay, nice, interesting. So then I tried to contact the developers. Hey, uh, maybe you have something to fix in your game. And they said, Oh, thank you very much, but uh, we do not have the time to fix it right now. Maybe later. Uh, plus, uh, we do not own the code anymore. It's this other company over there. So maybe it's a bit complicated to change the, the code. Okay, so status, not patched. Then uh, we did some analysis on the blood uh, game. And apparently the developers of this game, which is very interesting, they already patched, they already fixed the issue in the 90s. So fixed a long time ago. Observation, so maybe they did, maybe they did not report this to the developer of the build engine, but none of the other games uh, were patched. So communication problem here, I don't know. Okay, so we look at the third game, so Redneck Rampage, so you, buy, you can buy this game for nine euros. So we contact the, the company. Hello, uh, maybe you want to have a look into that. Yeah, sure. Let me contact the security department. <laughs> All right. So now they contact the security department and they come back to me after one month. They say, oh, sorry, we cannot fix it. So I was like, why? Why can't you fix it? Okay. So I had a, big, a bit a look on the internet more to see what is the company that developed that game. 
So it was the Monolith Company. Okay, so let's try to contact the Monolith Company. Oh no, it has been bought by Activision. Okay, so let's try to contact Activision. Oh no, it has merged with Activision Blizzard. Okay, let's try to contact them. Oh no, they have split again in two different companies. Oh no, let's try to contact them. Oh no, it has been bought again by uh, Interplay. Let's try to contact Interplay. So I go on the website of Interplay, and then I have a page under construction. Okay. And then I go, I go back to, to, to these uh, gog.com people. So they say, ah, okay, so I went to Interplay. The page is under construction. Maybe you can give me some contact information. Surely you have some contact information to the people there. And so the, the company says, well, we cannot give you any more information. That's what is publicly available. So I say, okay, thank you very much. Goodbye. So still unpatched. And so... I scrolled down this page of this red, Redneck Rampage game, and I noticed that the game is powered by DOSBox. Aha, okay, interesting. So at this point, we know how to run arbitrary code under DOS. So we also know that those DOS programs run on today's machine within DOSBox, right? And so these programs are in a kind of cage, apparently, right? Because you would suppose, okay, if you run a DOS program within DOSBox, I mean, the program does not have access to anything else that what is within DOSBox. And, well, I don't know if you're fans of Star Trek, but uh, let me remind you of what Christopher Pike said when he was imprisoned by some alien life forms. He said, there's a way out of any cage and I will find it. Okay, so let's try to behave a bit like Christopher Pike uh, and look a bit at DOSBox. Um, and the first thing you notice is that DOSBox allows to mount part of the host file system. All right? So this allows an attacker to modify scripts, but most modifications of the file system require user action to run code, right? So the situ situation is really already bad, right? Because an attacker, for instance, could modify this, uh, this bash or C to insert the backdoor, for instance. But the attacker would have to wait until the user launches a new bash session for his code to be executed. So is there something we can do when we have access to the host file system to directly execute arbitrary code? Well, yes, all right? So on some distribution, you have this proc file system that is automatically mounted. So this is the case on Debian or Ubuntu, for instance. And this gives uh, the process access to a hierarchical file-like structure. And this structure on the file system so allows um, to have access to process data held in the kernel. Okay, what is this? So we look a bit at what is in the proc file system, and you can see that you have access to proc self maps, which basically gives you the mapping. Okay, at this address I have uh, this library, at this address I have DOSBox, at this address I have the stack. So basically you bypass ASLR directly, but it also gives you access to proc self mem, right? So you can actually read and write from the virtual addresses of the process. All right, second demo. Um, yeah. So user, user. All right, so I start DOSBox here. So here is the vulnerable, vulnerable version of DOSBox that I run inside the virtual machine. Um, so yeah, so suppose you're the attacker, you, you, you have you can run arbitrary code within DOSBox, okay? So how can you bypass ASLR? So you type this, mount p proc self, okay, p. Oh, um, I think this is it, maps. And here you have all the addresses of all the libraries loaded for DOSBox, right? Really interesting. Um, yeah, so you get the result from proc self maps to bypass ASLR and locate where the stack is. And then you basically write to proc self mem to override the stack. And what we will do here is that we will override the stack with a rub chain to execute a 
well, arbitrary code, but in our case, a specific binary. You probably already know what the binary will be, but let's uh, not say too, too fast what it is. So during the attack, so you will be writing to this proc self mem uh, um, file, and when you write to that file, so this is what the stack looks like uh, in DOSBox, and basically we just run to override the return address of the latest, of sort of the first function here on that stack, and then we can execute arbitrary code. And this is time for demo three. Um, all right, so we go back here, um, and we, can we do, oh, let me restart this. So we restart those box, and we have mem here. Then here, uh, so we read this proc self map, then we look in the memory if we have the right gadgets, and then we find the stack location, then we rewrite the return address of the last uh, function the stack, and then we execute arbitrary code, which in our case is a calculator. All right, um, so yeah, disclosure process. So in February, we notified uh, the developers of DOSBox about this. Uh, then we had a nice uh, discussion with them on how to fix this issue. And it has been patched like in June this year. And so now you have a bit of a more secure version of DOSBox that you can use to run those programs. And yeah, I would like to thank uh, one of the developers, uh, Cubix, because uh, we really had nice discussions on this, so it was really a pleasure to work with them. Um, and success. So this time I went to Meet. I said, okay, I want a CV number. They said, yeah, no problem. And then because uh, the, DOS boss, the, the DOS box developer acknowledged the vulnerability, so they were able to see that it's actually a real vulnerability, so they uh, they uh, opened the, the CV number, so that was pretty cool. Um, all right, so, and there's another guy, actually, you probably know, who still uses Docs, DOSBox. Any idea? Sorry? Yeah. I, I don't know. No, that's not the one I was thinking about. So, um, so he uses WordStar under DOS, so WordStar is a text editor. Maybe if you read the title of this slide, you can probably guess. Yeah. So this guy actually uses DOS, <laughs> right? So, well, you probably all know this Game of Thrones stuff, and so all the books were written under DOS. So I was kind of interesting, interested by this. So, um, so by the way, this is what Word Star looks like, right? So the Game of Thrones books were written using this kind of software. And so I, I was reading the article, and um, and he describes a bit the kind of machines he has at home. So he said, oh, I have one normal computer that I use to browse the internet, and then I have this other machine that is a DOS machine that I use to write my books. And this machine is not connected to the internet, right? Because I don't want anyone to steal my latest book. And then the, so the, the journalist continues the, the text and he says, oh, Martin doesn't have to worry about being attacked by a computer virus or by hackers hoping to get the next book, right? And well, do we have actually all the ingredients to steal his latest book? So now you can actually convince him to run a build-based game on a specially crafted map to infect his DOS machine, right? So you just phone him, hi, Martin, so yeah, I have this game with dragons, yeah, you can run it on your DOS machine, it's really awesome. Okay, now you compromise his DOS machine. And then, since he's using technologies from the 80s, he probably also have a fax machine connected to his computer. So, and we have seen last year by a talk uh, by AL that there's a way to compromise fax machines, right? So you can actually compromise a fax machine, infect his personal computer. Now you have infected his DOS machine, you have infected his uh, personal computer. What remains to be done? 
well, a covered channel between the two, so you can basically use the floppy drive to make some music, and then uh, from the PC, you record the music and you convert the music into bytes, and then you send the book to your email address, and you have the latest book of uh, G or, or Martin. All right, so, but please do not try this at home, right? Okay. And so a kind reminder, if you try to isolate your machine, do not accept any untrusted data. Um, right, so to conclude, DOS is not dead, so there's at least one person in the world that still uses a real DOS machine. Uh, so it's, a, it's an interesting attack surface because programs are smaller, they are not well tested, and so basically there's no security mechanism in place, so it's really easy to, to compromise. Also, if you find vulnerabilities in DOSBox, then you can jump from within DOSBox to the host system, and this is really a nice example for students, right? Because you go from technologies from the 90s to technologies from today, and you see uh, different kind of vulnerabilities. And hey, I now have some CVEs. Thank you very much. Any questions? Hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I assume you used AFL to fast this, right? Yes. And I'm pretty interested in how how your setup was uh, to get it running on on DOSBox, or did no, you no, no, no. So, so run yeah, it on so, DOSBox? So, so um, I mentioned that. So we actually do the fuzzing on a port of the, this DOS program, a Linux port. So ah, we okay. have this, and so we identify the vulnerability, and then we go back to the DOS program and we check if the code is the same. Okay, thank you. Yeah, on my way. Uh, you said you had a discussion on how to patch the vulnerability in uh, this box. Mm -hmm. My question is, uh, how did you patch it? Was it a challenge? Well, um, that's a good question. Thank you. So the, the the right way of patching it would have would have been to to prevent um, any access from within those box to the to the host machine, right? Uh, but it, it, it's a bit more complicated because DOSBox is already shipped uh, with other software. For instance, is already shipped with Wine. And basically the developers did not want to break this compatibility with Wine. So basically what they did for this CVE is to only prevent access to the PROC file system. More questions? We have time. So uh, you showed us how you go um, execute code on a Linux system via the proc file system. Mm -hmm. uh, have you thought about how you could do it on Windows and if it's possible on Windows? So yes, so we've also tried that on Windows, but not the um, direct code execution. But uh, we, a colleague of mine actually uh, said, well, you can actually just write something under that directory, and then if the machine reboots, then this will be executed. So, okay, I did that. I wrote some link, I think, to the calculator, and then I rebooted the machine, and the calculator just popped up when when the machine was rebooted. So it's also possible, but you have to have user interaction. You cannot, I, I guess, I mean, I'm not a Windows specialist, but I guess you cannot directly execute code through the file system. Okay, thank you. If no further questions, thank you very much.